Will you pray with me, please? Holy One, we come here this morning opening our dry and parched hearts that we may be filled with the living water of your Son. Transform our spirits and souls and allow me to be the vessel from which you pour. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The woman at the well. That is how the gospel story we read this morning is known. It's an interesting story on a whole number of levels. In fact, it has so many levels we could spend hours here this morning studying and dissecting each and every line, pulling meaning out of each of them. It's a long story. It took a little bit longer to read this morning than we're used to, and we still only read about half of it. In fact, this is the longest conversation we have between Jesus and anyone in the Bible. And that is the first point I want to highlight this morning that Jesus talks to a woman at the well. Why does this even matter? It matters because the people at the time said it mattered. Because women, respectable women, they would simply not go off on their own even to get something as as important as water. And this fact that this woman was off on her own getting water in the middle of the day, it's been interpreted pretty much as one way during the centuries. And that is that this woman was no longer part of the larger community. She had to go get water all by herself. She had to go out in the middle of the day when nobody else would go with her. She was not allowed to go with all the other people who went to the well. And the implication of all of that is, again, respectable women would not risk being associated with a woman such as her. You may have guessed by now that this woman at the well never gets a name in this story. Just the woman at the well. The next thing that happens is that when Jesus approaches her, he talks to her. And she talks back. You have to remember now, these are two outcasts. One, a man from a foreign and despised land, the land of the Jews, now in Samaria, and the other, a woman from a town that despises her. I think we might need a quick backstory here. This whole part about Jews and Samaritans not associating with one another, not liking one another. In fact, they hated one another. And the extremely simplified reason is that they had split from one another. They used to be one people, one family. And they split basically over one issue. Marriage. And who could marry who? And when two people from this one group got married to someone else from another group, that the first group thought they shouldn't be marrying, the rift between them grew larger and larger and larger until finally both groups couldn't stand the sight of each other and sought to cast the one group out, which is why Samaritans are often depicted as the enemy in the Bible. But then, oddly enough, They become the heroes in the Bible once Jesus comes on the scene. You remember the Good Samaritan? 
and now this woman at the well. I'm wondering if anyone else has ever encountered something that, like that in your lives. If you haven't, I hope you'll be invited to two marriage ceremonies I have been asked to perform this summer between loving people who others might see as despised people. But I'm getting ahead of the story and what Jesus can and will do for those of us often put into the despised category of people. Although one more thing, actually one more thing. Can you think of another group perhaps that is splitting this very day largely over a disagreement of the same thing? This one is a religious group, one of the largest religious groups in our country, the Methodist Church. The United Methodists are no longer united, all because of how one group says LGBT people should be shunned and the other says, no, we shouldn't. It's a very sad situation we are on. We are watching unfold in the very same way it has for centuries, all the way back to the time of the Jews and Samaritans separating, which was like 700 BC. I actually have one more example before we move on, and that is this mass hysteria that is taking place over, over one group of people over another, people with power, all because of some drag queens. <laughs> People dressing up in dresses to entertain. And if you don't think I have an, an affinity for drag queens, just look at how I dress every week. <laughs> I think it's quite flattering. May not be covered in sequins, but the only reason that is it's because black is slimming. <laughs> and I need all the help I can get there, especially with the camera adding 10 pounds at least. Now we can go back to the story of the woman at the well. Gosh, I don't even know where I am anymore. <laughs> we'll pick it up here. Samaritans didn't like Jews. Jews didn't like Samaritans which, by the way, is still going on between those two groups of people. The woman doesn't get a name to make this point that others didn't think she deserved a name, and now these two hated people are meeting at a well. Jesus, hated by the Samaritans, and the woman, not only hated by Jews, but her own townspeople. And the point, here's the point, I think defines this whole story is that neither one of them cared what others would think about them. Neither one, neither Jesus nor the woman at the well gave one thought of what others would say about them meeting at the well and talking with one another even to the point that when Jesus' disciples, you know, it says they return and they wonder what's going on and, and you know, a little bit that we left out today, they, they take on this very combative posture. You know, who is this woman and why are you talking to her, Jesus? Don't you know who she is? You know, we're supposed to hate her. What are you doing? And Jesus simply dismisses their protest. And she, the woman at the well, now confronted with, what, at least 12 or 13 angry men, which is threatening enough on its own, she stands her ground. It's her land, after all. They're the ones trespassing. And it's her that Jesus wants to talk to. Why should she leave? She does leave, however, but it's not because she's fleeing for her life. 
She flees because she has been given life, a new life. And not a life that discards her past, but a life renewed because of her past. A past that, according to the people she lives with, still defines her present and her future. And from now on, the rest of the story, it is her experience and her actions that come to define the story of the woman at the well. So much so that she has been called, rightfully so, the first evangelist to go and tell others about Jesus. The first woman evangelist, for sure, and the first to go into this enemy territory and tell the Samaritans about this Jewish Messiah that has wandered in to their land. And when she does that, she's lost any shame and discarded any of the hurtful stereotypes that her own people had put on her. And she becomes the one bringing new life into this community that was starving to death, thirsting to death, choking to death on their own sense of self-righteousness and entitlement and hate of other people and with the ability to oppress other people. They had the power. This nameless woman at the well, so maligned by scholars and preachers and others for centuries, she is the one who still comes through as the heroine of this story about Jesus asking for a, a cup of water. A cup of water, mind you, most others in that land would have denied him. So what have we learned now in this very abbreviated look at the story of Jesus and the woman at the well? Simply put, Jesus did not care and does not care about societal and cultural and religious and bigoted attitudes. He went where no other person of his background would go. He went right into the heart of Samaria, the land of his enemies, the land that people scorned, the land and people that, that others called dogs and animals, just to sit and meet the one person in both Samaria and Israel that he shouldn't be meeting. And Jesus, you know, he's not ignorant of what he's doing. He wasn't being fooled by anyone. He wasn't, you know, this woman wasn't fooling him. He wasn't sitting in the presence of someone who was going to lead him astray, pervert him in some way that would cause others to exclude him from proper society. He knew, and he knew her background. He knew... It says that she had been married five times and was now living with another man that she was not married to. And Jesus knew, he knew that this did not make her the one who should be ostracized. But rather, the ones who were doing the ostracizing should be the ones because they were doing it all just to keep people in line. Now, I do need to talk about this five husband thing. We can't just go right over it. <clears throat> but you have to remember there's only two reasons a woman would have had five husbands back then. One is that all of them died. And she kept having to marry again which was required back then. 
lest she become one of those poor widows that Jesus talks about that needs extra care and attention, cast out. The other reason is that it was only the man in this relationship who could ever initiate a divorce. And I love this. He only had to go out into the town square and say three times, I always picture clicking his heels, to make it, to it, make it legal, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, and they're done. Jesus knew this. And it made him love her even more. For what he saw was a woman striving to survive mostly on her own. Mistreated by others. Forced to live within a stereotype others had put upon her. Forced to live in a community that may have tolerated her, but didn't want anything to do with her. And when Jesus saw her, he immediately knew her. And when he met her, he not only gave her this new life, but a new source and font of love. The love he has for everyone. The love that God has for everyone. So what about her past? Good or bad? And who gets to say whether it's good or bad? When Jesus looked upon her, he saw already a whole person. One child of God in need of compassion, not scorn. And aren't most of us thankful that Jesus can see beyond our past and into what we really need? That Jesus can still, can still touch us today in a way that can change our whole lives in the time that it takes to simply have one conversation. And when this happens, and it will happen, isn't it nice to be able to lose our fear of what others think about us and we become the ones to go out into the world and spread good news this time? even to the ones who have been hurting us. I can tell you that my answer to all of those questions is yes. I am glad that Jesus doesn't stop anywhere in my past and obsess over all the things I've done that other people might look at and say, you don't have much worth there left, John. One too many things you did, if not ten. I'm also glad Jesus doesn't dismiss my past, but heals it, heals me, makes me whole. So much so that I am even more blessed by having lived through all of that in the first place. And yes, I am glad to know that Perhaps I can be a living example of the life-giving message that I was and am given every single day. And that command to, you know, love our enemies, it suddenly doesn't seem so difficult when I live my life knowing that we all need something. And I know that I am not the only one to have experienced these things, for I see it happening on a daily basis right here. I see people who used to look down upon those who needed a handout 
to come to love those whose real need is simply compassion. I see people who would have looked away and crossed the street to avoid a homeless person come to want to care for them in ways that simply restores their dignity as a person. Dignity within a community that still is seeking to get rid of them. I see people relearn what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Or perhaps learn for the first time that it may not be what you have been told in the past to become a follower of Jesus. Because as we know, the past is not always a good indicator of the future. And if you don't believe me, because we kind of went here and there this morning, go home and read the story of the woman at the well again. It won't kill you to read the whole thing. And when you do, you will see for yourself that everything we talked about today and more can be found and proved in a story about an unnamed woman who goes to a well to get what she needs to stay alive, only to be given what she needs to truly live and live forever. And know that it is Jesus who is the one that sees and feels every teardrop and stands by our side, making us free and whole, healing our hearts and our souls. Will you pray with me, please? Holy and loving God, we cannot thank you enough for the love you expressed through your Son, the love that continues to reach out and embrace each and every one of us, each and every person in this entire world. We ask that you Continue to fill us and allow us to be aware of your love. That we may be so grateful that we are the ones who go out and help heal others. And we ask this morning that through the power of your healing Holy Spirit, those who could not hear these words today, those who are sick, body, mind, or soul, may feel the touch of your love in their lives. Because we love you and thank you in the name of Christ, amen. 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 And now my friends, let us, let's take a moment of silence and allow God to enter fully into us once more. Amen. Amen.